So, um, as it is uh, the case for every uh, very good uh, conference, as it is one, there is always somebody who speaks and has nothing to do with the conference, so that the real speakers uh, uh, get confirmed uh, that they are doing good stuff, and I am in this in this uh, uh, group. Uh, this is collective work uh, that have been done uh, in collaboration with several people, and uh, uh, some of whom I am here, and I, I apologize for uh, presenting uh, the work uh, not optimally. Um, and uh, uh, the reason why I don't know what I'm going, uh, what I'm talking about, is I'm not very sure about how what I'm saying has to do with interfaces. It could be, it could not be. What I want to do is to just uh, give some uh, philosophical and experimental um, uh, ideas uh, that turn around these two ideas that uh, have been proposed both by Jerry Fodor and by others, notably Chomsky, the idea of modularity and the idea of language of thought. And uh, um, these ideas uh, were supposed to explain very different things. So the language of thought was supposed to explain things like these, uh, the fact that we can uh, explain certain kind of uh, uh, psychological facts by using uh, um, uh, reasoning, like uh, if somebody wants something and somebody sa knows that uh, uh, a tool will bring about the satisfaction of something, he or she will do uh, ceteris paribus what has to be done. That requires to have inter, among other things, to be able to have uh, logical representations, which are probably domain general, and to have certain rational abilities, to come to a rational conclusion about certain kind of premises. Modularity was introduced to explain things which are completely different, like, for example, how in the right conditions we can see uh, that percept as uh, a three-dimensional percept. And that the properties of modules were completely, were quite different from the properties that have been appealed to introduce the language of thought, such as, for example, the fact that there are computations which are domain-specific, uh, that, as Felicin uh, uh, said, are cognitively impenetrable, so they don't have access to information, which could be nevertheless in the system, and in a certain important sense, they are not rational, in the sense that you cannot change them if you want to. Okay, they've been selected that way. Okay, there is a certain tension between the two uh, uh, theses, because it looks like the language of thought appeals to certain kind of principles that uh, uh, the modularity thesis denies. And uh, what I want to show here is that it's possible to just make progress in one. Let's, let's see the success of these uh, ideas. If we can take the two books by Jerry Fodor, the modularity of mind and the language of thought as a proxy for how good these ideas were and how well they were received, and we Google them, we find by and large that the modularity of mind has about 270 citations per year. So uh, this uh, was a pretty successful research program on which everybody here is still working. Um, but if you take the language of thought, um, we find about one third of these quotes. And if you look at who quotes these uh, 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 this book, uh, uh, you barely find uh, a scientist. So there has been a, a very, very uh, biased uh, um, set of uh, uh, research, uh, biased, a very successful set of research uh, on the chapter modularity of mind, and uh, we don't know much about the language of thought. What I want to show today, what I want to propose today, is that it is possible to also develop that, uh, 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 that other program in an empirical research program. The way to do it is I'm going to concentrate on two cases, uh, logical representation and some ideas about uh, uh, probability reasoning. And uh, I want to uh, first introduce the intuitive ideas of why I think that some of the basic tenets of the language of thought, namely the idea that there are logical representations, that we have inferences over them, is good and should be good for an organism as uh, young as a, a little baby. So suppose that you have uh, uh, um, this, which is the state of the world. And suppose that you have a mental representation of this in, by, uh, I don't write in language of thought because I know that only I understand it, so I just wrote in English, but uh, imagine that it's language of thought. So this is a mental representation of, uh, of a state. Now suppose that the world gets a little more complex, uh, and so instead of having one circle, you have another circle, while well, you can still have a mental representation that uh, uh, follows up uh, this kind of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, state of the world, and if a state of the world that gets more complex, you can still make mental representation that keep up the relation between what you have in the mind and what you have in the world. But you can figure out that this is going to become uh, quite quickly very complex. Now, if you only have one little word in your language of thought, one little logical word, the quantifier, you can always represent this sentence in a very compact way. 
has a, a sentence saying that all circles are yellow. And the advantage of this representation is that the world can change very much, but your mental representation remains stable. So you have all the interest to have this representation in the moment in which you have a very complex situation. By contrast, one just little change in the world can allow you to update a mental representation, for example, if you have negation, that keeps up once again with the state of the world. So uh, if you have a, a rich uh, logical representation, so you have a possibility to keep a track with, of what happens in the world in a much more effective way. Logic has another advantage, this is the corresponding advantage. Suppose that you have a representation which contains quantifier like this one and the representation uh, like this one. Now, you don't need anything else to figure out the uh, solution of this problem. In other words, the, uh, once you have logical representation, if you also have logical rules of inferences, you have a way of packing and unpacking information which is extremely efficient. So what I am saying now is that if this is the world as complex as it could be, you could have logical representation that are a compact way to represent this world, and then you have logical reasoning, which is a way to unpack uh, this kind of uh, uh, information. Unpacking means that in certain uh, conditions, you can even know things that you have never experienced because they come out from the logic of uh, 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 your uh, uh, reasoning. Okay, that's what I think. I think there is a logic in the mind, and the logic in the mind has this main effect uh, it has the effect to say, suppose you have a reasoning like A or B, there is a D, if A then C, B then C, C then E. If you can reason out of these things, basically what you do is you organize your mental space. For example, in sub, uh, 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 in sub goals, uh, uh, this is a large part of what uh, Tim Shalis, who is here, has done. And, and uh, you can uh, uh, basically have from uh, um, uh, a single state in which everything is equal you can come up with uh, uh, a mental structure which has the very same property that we have found to be in language. It is recursive, it is organized with goals and sub-goals, and it can essentially give uh, a structure that otherwise you would not have. Okay, uh, this structure also allows you to figure out in this case that no matter what, there is going to be an E. So find out conclusions about the world or about uh, the situation that you don't need necessarily to have experienced. Okay, so what I said until now is that if you want to design a, an organism rationally, you want to put some stuff in it. And I suggested that if you have logical representation, that's good, a way of coding information efficiently. If you have logical reasoning, that's even good, a way to just pull out information from your coded uh, uh, pieces of information when it is needed. And uh, this can be put to, uh, uh, to service to do rational predictions, to say, for example, right, I've never experienced this situation, but I reason about it, and I figure out that that has going to, uh, it's got to happen. Slight complication more, uh, the world is quite complex, and in 99% of the cases, uh, reasoning is not reasoning about logic, but reasoning about uncertain situations. So there, there's got to be a way to link this structure to reasoning about probability. What I'm going to propose is a way to do it theoretically and give some experimental evidence about it. Okay, that's the, the big picture that I have. Turns out that I'm not really particularly popular because uh, uh, the 90% of the literature really claims that there is not this ability to reason logically. Uh, so, for example, uh, we all know about uh, Piaget and this idea that you don't have logic until you are like 14 or 15 years old. Uh, but this is not an unpopular, uh, this is not an old uh, uh, point of view. Most of the literature about uh, reasoning claims indeed that we have very limited ability to reason in a domain general way by using logic and uh, uh, the most uh, uh, relevant uh, point of view that I could refer to has been uh, proposed by Evans and since then by many people, and it is connected to this idea that uh, human reasoning is really not logical, is really not rational, it's riddled by biases, and uh, uh, you don't even have logical representation, you only have exemplars in your mind, and you reason out of just simple exemplars. Okay. Um, if it is that way for adults, so much, so much worse will it be for infants, and that's uh, uh, a, a statement that you can encounter in your career. So, for example, this is uh, the reaction of uh, uh, a reviewer when we sent a paper saying that infants could reason. Okay, no, they cannot because it's an anthropomorphic way to see it, uh, infants. All right. Um, uh, this is not only so for uh, uh, the literature about deductive reasoning. There is a very so respectable and long tradition that says that you, we are not even able to reason probabilistically. Uh, so, for example, 
uh, consider uh, the heuristic and biases literature, Fred and Kahneman, uh, uh, classic examples, they say that you can't reason about uh, uh, the future essentially because you don't know how to reason probabilistically. So if I put a, problem, a probability uh, uh, reasoning about a single case, what is going to, what uh, Tom W is going to do in the future, you just will fail. And even those who disagree with, uh, sharply disagreed with uh, uh, Tresk and Kahneman, and they do think that there is a way to reason about probabilities, they agree on the fact that this reasoning does not apply to the most important case for us, namely reasoning about what is happening next in the future. So, for example, uh, the frequency flying uh, held by Cosmides, Tubi, uh, Gigerenzer says, no, you can reason about uh, probabilities, but only if you experience frequency. To just put uh, uh, quotes in the mouth of people, this is a quote that comes from a very famous paper by Cosmides and Tubi that says that the probability of a single event, what will Tom, Tom W do next, is intrinsically unobservable, therefore it doesn't make sense. No? Uh, no sense organ can discern that if you go to the North Canyon, there is a 25% probability that today's hunt will be successful. Either it will or it won't. That's all we can observe. For the, for the existence, it's not supposed to be there. So there, is no, there are not the condition of uh, uh, selection that would have selected a general domain, non-specific system of reasoning, in, according to this theory. And that's what very clear. What has been selected? Well, what has been selected is only uh, a system that could uh, uh, track the encounter frequency of, of actual event. Uh, the fact that we went uh, 10 out of 20 times uh, in the North Canyon to the left and we found the lion, so we're not going to go there anymore, okay? So that's the point. We have only selected things that our hominid ancestor had and what they had is what they call a rich flow of observable frequency, okay? Now, if you take this position seriously, you should get to the conclusion that you can't predict any future event without having experienced something from the past. That's what frequency is about, doing, uh, using the past to predict the future, okay? All right, uh, what I want to suggest is that there is much more to reasoning than just uh, tracking uh, uh, past frequencies. And uh, because I have quoted many big uh, 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 guys, I need to counter them with big guys. So w the point of view that I want to refer to is really been expressed uh, very uh, uh, coincidentally by Wittgenstein in this sentence, the facts in the logical space are the world. The, what, what does this quote mean? Well, it means essentially that the world is not what there is, but also what there could be. Right? Uh, that facts are modal objects. That uh, what I see in front of me is this object like that, but I know that this object could be like that, could be like that, could be like that, it's always the same object. And so what I'm proposing that when infants perceive the world, they already perceive it modally, they have an idea that uh, uh, there is a logical space in which objects could, are located, that uh, uh, this logic is possible uh, uh, a foundation for uh, intuitions of probability, and this ability to have logic plus probability allows infants to make rational predictions. Let me just give you some of the steps of this proto-theory I, I want to propose. The idea is the following. Suppose you are seeing something, so I introduce you to some of the experimental material that uh, we have used. I call this the fact level. This is what you are see this is what you are seeing in front of your uh, uh, of your eyes. This is something like an uh, object that moves inside the ball. Okay, you see that, but you think of it modally. You think of it in terms of what there is, or but also what there could be. And what there could be are different states of the world in the future, in the next immediate future, which could be, for example, well, there is an object that falls out from here which is yellow. There is another object which is yellow. There is another object which is yellow. There is an object which is blue. I call this the logical level, the representation of the possible space of uh, possibilities in the next future. If you can represent possibilities that way, you can also count them. Numerical level has been uh, uh, deeply inspected, so you can know that there are three of one kind, one of another kind, and therefore you can uh, uh, make an estimation of the probability that uh, uh, the object that will fall down will be yellow. From that estimation, you can make rational prediction. If I have to bet, I bet over the yellow, okay? The idea that infants go to these kind of uh, 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 stages when they are reasoning. And what I'm going to give you is some evidence about the logical level and some evidence about the probability level today. Okay. Um, I cannot resist by starting with the, the end state. I know I shouldn't do it because I know nothing about the brain except that it is in between the two years and not everybody has it. But uh, um, there is evidence that in the uh, um, uh, final state, we do compute the brain computes uh, logical forms and uh, valid uh, uh, consequences. So let me quote 
a little, and there is an interesting issue about what heuristics do, which I will pick up later when I talk about adults. Uh, about infants. Okay, so suppose that I give you, um, uh, uh, this is the theory that I think is correct, it's not important to look at it in the detail, but the idea is the following, you see things, you understand, you select a logical form of what is happening, this logical form feeds into a national deduction rules that allows you to draw inferences, and this allows you to select responses. And these national deduction rules have certain properties, they're psychologically valid, they're universal, they could, they're primitive, uh, and they can be uh, uh, extremely elementary from the psychological point of view. Let me show you some of these rules, and I'm going to follow some of them in, uh, in detail. Uh, things like, for example, instantiation. For all the x, p of x, therefore, p of a. Things like elimination of alternatives. There is an a, or reasoning by case. There is an a or a b, there is not an a, therefore, there is a b. Or things like modus ponens. If a, then b, a, therefore, b. These are not arbitrary uh, steps, if you have this plus negation, you have all the reasoning you want to have, okay? Um, what I want to suggest is that the adult brain already has specialized mechanisms to, to deal with this kind of uh, uh, devices, the, the, uh, inferences, and, and I want to suggest the, the infant brain, the infant mind, too. Okay, so um, um, what we did in, uh, in a set of experiments uh, that, uh, of which I participated very marginally, but I think they are interesting for the results, is to see how adults reason when they're given uh, very, very simple uh, problems that have no content at all. So they only elicit the logical structure. And what we tested is uh, uh, what happens when infant, uh, when adults give a, a response which is valid, logically valid, uh, or where they give a response which is not valid but coherent, and I'm going to explain it in a second, or when they give a response, as uh, the literature I quoted you uh, previously would suggest is the most prepotent response, coming from heuristic, non-logical responses. The way we did it is the following. We gave problems of this structure. So every B thing is A, where B and A were replaced by uh, a nonsense word. Every B thing is C. And uh, what follows from that? Well, you can find that uh, uh, one possible conclusion which is valid is that some A things are C. Okay, valid conclusion. But you can also make mistakes and give uh, answers which are wrong, like for example, no A things is a C, but every time you find this form of the problem, you always give the same answer. So you are wrong, but you are consistent in the way you are wrong. Okay? We call these consistent responses. Or else, and this is the interest of using this problem, uh, you can also find, uh, give other answers which are wrong, uh, they are not consistent with anything, but they respect a heuristics which have been studied in detail, which is called the atmosphere heuristic, which basically says, if you have lots of alls, respond with an all kind of sentence. Okay? So this is a very simple problem, but we can decorrelate if somebody answers by logic, if somebody answers by simply respecting the coherence with respect to the logical form of the sentences, even if he or she is wrong, or if he or she is following a heuristic. Okay. Um, Okay, so we did the design which works in the following way. You have a queue, and then you have a first premise that we presented uh, visually. Uh, the only thing you can do with this premise is to encode the premise, just to figure out that if it is, if it is uh, all A, R, Bs, it's all A, R, Bs. Then a second premise comes, and this premise could be of two forms. In one case, is a very simple form, like, for example, suppose that the first premise is all roughs are blickets. I don't know. I hope they are known words. I just put them in. Uh, myself. And suppose you get another premise which is John is a knock. Okay. You cannot do anything. You can only encode it. Okay. These are non-integrable premises. You cannot do anything with it. But you could have other premises which allow you to draw an inference. For example, suppose that the first premise is all roughs are blicket. The second is John is a rough. When you get this one, you could conclude that John is a blicket. Okay. Now, there is evidence in the psycholinguistic uh, literature that uh, adults spontaneously draw these inferences without than being asked to do that. And we rely on that in this paradigm. Okay? Uh, after that, we present conclusions and we ask uh, adults to uh, answer uh, uh, whether the conclusion, which conclusion they would follow from these premises. Now, importantly, uh, let me repeat this. This premise is not integrable. This premise is integrable. So we can subtract from the same premise presented in the same position whether this requires a logical step or not. Okay? And 
what you're seeing here is the uh, fMRI signal of the subtraction of these, uh, of these uh, two conditions, inferences on inferences, and you can see that uh, there is, again, a network that uh, partially overlaps with what uh, uh, Stan uh, presented before. It's completely, uh, 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 almost completely left uh, 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 lateralized, and it includes a lot of uh, temporal frontal and also some parts which are uh, uh, median and even uh, uh, basic ganglia area. Okay. What we are interested in is what do these areas do? And the way that my collaborators found uh, to do it was to figure out if they can predict reversely what people will do according to what kind of uh, uh, area uh, is activated. So what they do is they take each of these areas one by one and they figure out if the fact that you have this area mostly activated predicts whether it will respond validly, whether it will respond consistently, or whether it will respond according to a heuristics. Okay? And what uh, uh, we found is the following, that there is one area that predicts almost 80% of the subjects who respond using uh, uh, consistently. That is, they are sensitive to the logical structure of the problem. They may, 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 may uh, give a wrong answer, but they consistently give that answer when the problem has that structure. Okay? And this is a, a BA4445. Whereas another area is entirely, BA47 is entirely the, uh, uh, the area that responds to uh, validity. In other words, if you know that this area is active, you can predict what subjects will respond uh, validly. Okay? So it is possible in the adult brain to figure, to show, oh, and interestingly, no area uh, gives an answer to people who, can, no area can be used to predict if uh, uh, people give a heuristic response. Okay? Now, this is interesting because it suggests the following picture that, uh, uh, com re remember the thesis that I presented you before, the, the anti-logical thesis that people use heuristics and not logic to reason. Well, if anything, what this experiment suggests is that uh, uh, it's uh, logical representations that are more deeply entrenched in the brain and not the heuristics uh, uh, strategies. That should be the most ancient, the most uh, 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 the most used and the most uh, prominent when we give a response. Okay, so my point here is uh, uh, if we look at the adult brain, there is a reason to suppose that the logical level is well represented and that we can reason indeed by using uh, 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 domain general uh, uh, inferences procedure. Okay, what happens we need it with infants? Okay, we are trying to answer this question little by little. It's a tough question, and uh, uh, it uh, probably cannot be answered in principle. What we are giving, going to give is inductive evidence that there is a response. The way to do it is that we are testing non-speaking uh, uh, non, uh, uh, infants, 12 months old, so we cannot ask questions. This turns out to be interesting, and we'll discuss about it later. But what we could do is we could present uh, situations that uh, more easily could be uh, are represented by using, for example, quantifiers. So the first question we're trying to ask is, do infants represent all versus some uh, at the moment in which I still don't have any idea what all and some means? Okay, so the way to do it, this is work by Erno Teglas, is that we familiarize infants with situations in which there is uh, a scene that is uh, repeated, and explicitly we use scenes that go across time so that we Whatever infants do, they have to do it by using a compact representation of what is happening here. So in this case, infants see that uh, uh, two actions, we know that infants can count actions and they open doors. Then we pass to a situation in which there are three uh, doors, but either the little guy does the same number of actions, okay, or else the little guy does a different number of actions. Okay? So if infants only count actions, the fact that this guy does three actions should be surprising. But if infants classify the first situation, the familiarization situation, as an all kind of situation, then they will be surprised when the little guy does the same number of actions but changes the logical structure. Okay? So basically what we're trying to pit is number of actions against logical structure. And here we give two doors which are visited, and then we pass in a situation in which two doors are visited, but one is skipped. Therefore, it's a sum kind of situation. Or as three doors are visited. So from the point of view of the numbers of actions, we have a change, but not so in the, uh, uh, sorry, but not so in the situation that, uh, uh, in the logical structure. Okay. Uh, sorry, I need to keep on slide. Uh, now, of course, we have the opposite situation. 
the open situation is one in which we start uh, with uh, um, uh, a situation like sum, and this is, uh, uh, we now have four doors, and four is crucial because it goes beyond subitizing, so for instance, this really cannot be represented by counting, okay? And uh, sometimes this uh, little uh, object opens two doors, sometimes it opens three, okay? So it always opens some doors, but not all. And then we go back to the situation as before with uh, uh, three doors, and sometimes it opens two, and sometimes it opens three. So the number of actions is the same, but in one case there's a logical change, the little guy opens all the doors, and in another case there is no logical change. Okay, um, Okay. so you figure out what uh, the situation is. Okay, what we found, we are testing 12 months old, and what we found in this situation is that uh, infants respond to the same scenes not according to the number of actions, but according to the logical nature of the familiarization. So, uh, if the familiarization contains an all, or contains a sum, uh, changes the way infants look at the situation. They look longer at the situation of the kind sum, if they are, uh, um, if they are um, uh, familiarized with an all, and they look longer with the situation of the kind all, if they are familiarized with the sum situation. Okay, we can also play... Uh, trace when this uh, ability appears, and it looks like we can locate it, I skip it for uh, simplicity, between 10 and 12 months, and we can go back to it again. The important thing is that is coming way beyond infants have available the resources to express the same conceptual relations verbally. Okay, um, we are now trying to find ways in which we test uh, little reasoning, and in this case we test the very same disjunctive syllogism that uh, I have talked and, uh, told you about. We now familiarize infants with scenes like this, and what you can see is that uh, uh, these objects have a particular kind of construction. All of them are, ma are done such that uh, uh, a part of them is similar. The top part is similar in couple and couple. Okay? Very well. Uh, then we test them, we continue familiarizing with the, the little parts of the situation, and finally we test them with a situation of this kind, in which uh, uh, an occluder doesn't let you know what object is inside, and you can only see the common part, okay? So you should say, this is an A or a B. Okay, now you see the object, and this should be an A, therefore inside there should be a B, and there is uh, what you expect. And we compare this with, of course, the situation in which uh, the two objects uh, are the same, there's an A or a B, but uh, uh, in this case, uh, there is uh, the surprising event, namely, uh, the object that should be the, uh, the B turns out to be the A, okay? We are trying to mimic situation in which we put infants in a condition of uncertainty with, with respect to an object, and we see whether there is a tendency to have expectations about what they, uh, uh, they have to find in the uh, uh, bucket. What we found, and this is all, uh, again, ongoing work, is that at 18 months, infants uh, look longer than impossible situation, but not so at 12 months. And that's interesting because uh, between 12 and 18 months, we know that linguistically infants can deploy uh, what is called uh, the mutual exclusivity strategy, which seems to uh, involve the same kind of logical structure. So if we uh, uh, ask uh, infants to look at the ducks, and we know that one of the, the two objects infants know, we know that between 12 and uh, uh, 18 months, they deploy this strategy by changing the way they use it, this is a data by Justin Halberta, uh, and they start by looking longer to the familiar object, as if they had to check what was there, and finally, at about 18 months, they apply the strategy uh, efficiently by looking immediately at uh, the unfamiliar object. Okay, so what we are trying to do, we are trying to figure out whether this ability to reason disjunctively depends on language or is coming before, okay? Therefore, we are bound to see what happens at 12 months, and for the moment, what we found is the following, we simplify the situation by insisting much more on uh, the, uh, uh, the common part of the object. So here, as you can see, the, uh, there is an insistence on the fact that these objects are confusable, okay? And when we do uh, uh, a kind of uh, situation like this one, we do find that even 12-month-old uh, infants are surprised at the impossible situation, but that definitely depends on the kind of object they have seen. If we, sp we use two kinds of couples, couples that contain a little face, and another object, or couples that don't contain any little face, and we do find that the result is uh, completely uh, carried by the fact that infants see a human and a non-human. Uh, at least for this situation, we can say that infants are able to reason 
logically we need a lot of controls and I'm completely aware of that but uh, uh, this is the first pass um, um, and they can deploy certain kind of uh, uh, inferential procedure that seems to require uh, the very same uh, basic inferences that uh, the mental logic theory supposes that uh, uh, are primitive. Okay, how can we go from there? And now we are working on that, trying to find ways in which we just follow one by one these kind of rules, find situations that could be easily represented that way, and see whether infants are responsive to some logical uh, uh, nature of the situation we present. How does this refer to probability? Well, uh, um, in the theory I presented, Probability really falls out of the fact that you represent the logical situations, okay? And the intuition is the following. Suppose that you are God and you are playing dice. You know that uh, he or she doesn't play dice, but suppose he does. Okay, you can play it two different ways. One way is, well, you don't know what happens with the dice. You just keep throwing it and just collect the frequencies. That would be a, a Gigerensen kind of God. But it is also possible that God knows something about the object and he or she figures out what are the possible outcomes independently of whether he or she perceived them of these objects counting six the probability that uh, uh, the object is uh, uh, giving five is one over six so you can reason about the probabilities if you have the notion of logical space independently of frequency information that's the point i'm trying to make okay all right so how do we test that infants are sensitive to intuition of probabilities that could be explained the way i propose they could be explained although of course i have no proof Okay. Well, what we did is basically we, we tried to teach infants to, to play, uh, to gamble. Uh, it looks like it worked for adults, why not for infants? So what we did, we did pre prepare, and this is again work by Erno Teglas especially, uh, situations in which objects were bouncing inside the container, infants had never seen the situation, indeed the physical parameters of movements of these objects are impossible, I mean they are not, they are possible but not represented in, in reality, and then there is one single object that comes out after an occlusion. Okay, either this object comes from the most represented class or the less represented class, and what we're going to see is whether infants find surprising the situation in which the improbable outcome occurs. Importantly, this is a single case outcome. What we found is that uh, indeed the 12 months old uh, look longer at the improbable situation. But this is really where the problem starts, not where the problem ends, because these results could depend on many, many factors that have nothing to do with, the, with probability. You can hear Tresk and Kahneman saying, oh, look, this is biases. For example, uh, you have situations here that uh, have uh, grouping information. So here you have three equal and one different, and here you have a mix. So maybe they look at this situation longer because they like the situation better. All right? How do we control for this? Well, we controlled in the following way. We basically made a possible situation, a probable situation impossible, and an improbable situation possible by just putting a bar inside. So now, uh, if there is a yellow that comes out, that's impossible, although ca it comes from the most uh, uh, represented class. So if infants respond to the properties, the surface property of the scene, they're pretty much the same. There's a grouping and there's a difference. But if infants respond to the nature of the scene, then they should invert their looking behavior with respect to the previous experiments. And that's what we found uh, when they look at the probable improbable situation, they look longer than probable. If I just put a bar that makes the probable situation impossible, their looking pattern reverts. Okay? Very well. Now we, uh, so it seems like they respond to certain uh, features of the situation that have to do with the number of objects, and this situation cannot be easily explained by looking at very surface uh, uh, features, like, for example, grouping properties. Okay, so it's not just biases. It's not just heuristics. Now, how can we push the situation? How can we show that infants indeed make rational predictions about uh, this, uh, uh, these uh, uh, situations? Well, what we did is we, um, we exploited the fact that situations are really very rich. And if you look at a situation like that, you have many, many kinds of information. One of them, for example, is how many objects there are. But another one is where objects are. So here there are three yellow and one blue. Okay, but uh, uh, if there is an occlusion that is very long, it's not important where they are. You only know that there are three yellows and one blue. They keep moving. If you don't see, you don't know. So you should bet on the probable, uh, the most probable outcome. But if there is a very short occlusion, okay, then you should be able to say, all right, no matter how many objects there are, 
I, I predicted the closest one to exit should exit. So you should adapt your prediction of what is probable and what is improbable according to features of the situation, the very same situation, which are very subtle uh, and nevertheless change the probability distribution, the, the, the expectation that you should have. Okay, so uh, that's what we did. We, we gave situations in which we manipulated whether the objects of the more or the less numerous categories were closer or more distant to the exit, and we manipulated the, uh, uh, the length of occlusion. Now, notice that this is a problem that uh, is very complex, and, th and that's, I think, where, what language does to us. Uh, if I see the situation, and there are many uh, cues, I can tell you, look, what's the probability that one yellow will exit, okay? Uh, or, or what's the probability that the closest one will exit? But to infants, we can only say, look here. That's the only thing that you, you can do to a non-linguistic uh, animal, okay? So what I think is happening with language it's not that language is changing our system of reasoning. What language does is it's a very good selector of information. So you can select what kind of information you can look at. And the problem with working with infants as well as with animals, you cannot do the same kind of selection. But if you find an interesting way in which you can outline the relevance of a certain kind of information, then you should be able to trigger the same kind of reasoning. Okay, uh, so what we did here is, uh, um, as, you, as I said before, we applicate, uh, we use the, the occlusion period as a, a way to see whether infants can adapt their predictions uh, rationally. Uh, again, if the occlusion is short, they should uh, look more at the physical information where the objects are. If the occlusion is long, they should look more at the class distribution of the objects. How many objects were yellow, how many objects were blue. And uh, uh, to just give you an idea what kind of stimuli we use, this is a zero second occlusion. So that, that's the final part of the scene. And uh, uh, this is a two-second occlusion, uh, which is the one where infants should go for probability. OK. And what we found is exactly that infants adapt what they do according to the length of occlusion. If the occlusion is long, they only respond to uh, the class distribution. No matter how um, where the objects are at the beginning, they really uh, bet that the object that come out is the object coming from the most probable class. But if we reduce the occlusion, we found a complete inversion. And when the occlusion is very short, the probability distribution doesn't count. What counts is only the position of the objects. OK. Um, it is possible to make uh, uh, formally meaningful this idea that infants are rational. And this is work especially done by George Tenenbaum and Ed uh, Rule, uh, who basically made a very simple model in which you assume a Bayesian inference mechanism. And for my purposes, this mechanism has to, has, has to have the logical rules that I was talking to you about before. Uh, assume that infants know something about objects, solidity, and continuity. And uh, assume that infants think that objects move uh, uh, in a, a non-predictable way, essentially, Brian movement. Uh, imagine that what infants do is infer the next future state by having this information, and then count the probabilities of possible outcomes, as I was suggesting before. By taking this model, you can entirely predict our data, and you can predict them quantitative, quantitatively in a very precise way. And uh, if you assume that the surprise is uh, the one minus the, minus the probability of the outcome, you can actually predict how much objects sh uh, infants should look at each situation. And uh, beyond that, you can uh, make a lot of prediction of previous results that are present in the literature. So there is reasons to believe that infants do adapt their reasoning uh, in a quite sophisticated way by using properties of the stimuli that are not obvious. OK. Um, I want to say another uh, thing before finishing. And uh, uh, this has to do with the fact that I am suggesting that infants use this way of reasoning to predict next future states. But there is a little problem in the literature, namely, uh, the 90% of the results that we have in infants' literature don't really test prediction. They really test what happens after. I show you a situation. This situation is surprising, and infants look longer at the surprising situation. That's exactly what I did in my data before. However, maybe infants are surprised because they predicted a particular outcome. Maybe infants are surprised because they predict nothing. They stay there, they look, and then post hoc, they look at the situation and see, Gee, this is strange. How come? And this uh, retroactive reasoning 
could allow them to make the prediction, the, 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 to have a longer looking time. How do we, uh, how do we disentangle between these two possibilities? This again work by Erno Tegler. Uh, basically, what we try to do is uh, to make a situation, sorry, let me just create the sound, in which the physical device now carries the probability distribution, okay? And uh, as you can see here, this object moves, and there, there is a certain moment, this moment, in which the object is exactly at the center. So you cannot predict where it's going to be when it closes. And now, at this moment, what we are going to do, we are going to look at uh, uh, eye movements as a measure that during occlusion, namely when infants are looking at nothing, they know that they expect the object to come up from a certain side, the one which has more exits, okay? If they do it, when then the object comes out from, in this case, the probable or the improbable side, we would expect to look them to look longer at the improbable exit. Okay? Um, okay, turns out that this was a very hard experiment to do because uh, it was uh, 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 difficult to figure out exactly how to do it. And uh, uh, the important thing to know for us is that the way in which we did it is the ball always comes out from one side to the right here. And we just flip the frame to make the probable or the improbable uh, uh, the relevant uh, uh, situation. Okay? So infants see the wall coming out from the right, uh, but sometimes the right has three holes, sometimes the right has one hole. Okay. Then what we do is uh, during occlusion, this is the general uh, structure of the experiment, during occlusion we monitor two regions of interest and we look at during occlusion where infants are looking and then the post-doc uh, uh, looking time as usual. What you're seeing here is uh, uh, the behavior of infants looking at this green square during occlusion. And what you can see here is that uh, um, the infants, this is the time before occlusion, and infants tend to move their eyes to the side where there are more uh, uh, exits, even having, without ever having uh, uh, experienced this situation. So there is a, an anticipation of the exit that is completely reversed when they see the improbable outcome. They tend to look where the object should come out and uh, uh, they reverse the looking time when they find the improbable uh, outcome. Okay. Again, we could imagine that this is a result that become, depends on biases. For example, this structure is perceptually richer in one side as opposed to the other one. So maybe infants are looking there because they have a better memory trace or something which is richer. Okay, what did we do to control that? Well, we did several things. Uh, uh, this is the most, uh, the clearest one. We basically replaced the exit with little holes, uh, little patches of the similar color, but they are very clearly uh, solid, okay? From the perceptor point of view, this percept is very similar to the, to the previous one, but now, the object should not be able to come out from this uh, 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 brown uh, uh, patches. And what we found indeed is that uh, uh, when infants see a situation as the one that I presented you before, again, they are surprised at uh, the object coming out from uh, the uh, less numerous uh, uh, hole. Uh, but when infants see the very same person with a slight difference, then they are surprised when the object comes out that there are the three patches, okay? So it looks like they indeed reason about uh, the number of exits that uh, exist to the right or to the left and not about, again, low level features of the stimuli, okay? I talked to, uh, this is the last point and it's interesting. Uh, um, I, I told you about anticipation, but this is not a result about anticipation. This is a result about what happens post hoc. Do infants also anticipate that the object should come out from the only possible side when they see a percept like this? And uh, the answer is, no, they don't. They anticipate that the object should come out from where there are three holes when the three holes are open. But they do not anticipate, and the anticipation result is here, they do not anticipate that the object should come out from the only point where it should come out, where they should know this, okay? We thought that that was funny and that depended on the fact that uh, the, the stimuli were, were different to perceive, so we tried several manipulations to make much clearer that there is only one possible exit there. So that's one of the, the situations that Erno prepared for us. Uh, this is very clear. It can't come out from the right. 
So if you want to anticipate, okay, well, you should anticipate that it comes out from the left, okay? Well, we tried several of these situations and we never found that infants anticipate. The infants are always surprised when they see an impossible outcome, but they do not anticipate a possible outcome. How come? Well, imagine that infants are really rational and they, they don't do stuff at random, they do stuff when they can get information out of it, okay? Well, then, they, that's exactly what they should be doing. Uh, if you assume that information is one minus probability, as in the model that I presented you before, when you know that an object comes out to the left, why should you anticipate? I mean, if I kill you, if you don't, you will. But if you look at the situations that you have nothing to do, why should you anticipate? Why should you prepare a muscular movement to anticipate a situation that you already know, whose outcome you already know? By contrast, when there is uh, an uncertainty situation, but there is a probability, anticipating gives you a gain of information. That's in information theory. And what we assume is that uh, uh, infants uh, exactly do this kind of computation of what kind of information comes out to be most relevant and most uh, important in the situation. And that's why they do not anticipate what they already know. Okay, again, another sign that infants seem to be very rational. Okay, this is again something that not everybody was convinced of. Uh, and uh, 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 so we are still waiting to find uh, uh, a publication uh, um, uh, way for these uh, uh, results. Okay, so that's what I, uh, that's, these are my conclusions. Uh, what I wanted to show is that, and in yellow, I, I, I'm what I put, what I think I showed, in yellow I put what I suggested that I would like to show. Uh, uh, I think that we have proved in several uh, ways that infants have a natural sense of probability. I suggested that it is based on a model representation of the world, uh, and I suggested that this model representation depends on the fact that infants are sensitive to the logical structure of the situation. They, re they represent situation by using quantifiers, by using disjunction, by using uh, uh, little reasonings about what they can represent. Uh, I think I also proved that uh, contra Cosmides, Tubit, Gigerenzer, there is no need of experiences, frequencies to reason about the future. You can reason logically about the future, and therefore, I think I gave a hint about the fact that uh, this hypothesis that Fodor put forward, that there is a language of thought that is, is organized syntactically, that it has certain particular rules of inference, can indeed become a scientific research program. I stop here and I thank you for your uh, kindness. Thanks a, a lot, Luca. We have time, about 10 minutes, for some questions. Any questions? Yeah, Luca? Yes, yes, there is a question here. Yeah, my question, I was just curious about one result you had. So you were, your argument is that they are applying, that they have lo logical functions, right? babies in a way to put it my, my hope yeah yes. but one of, in one of the results you had you were showing that they seem to be applying a logical function when the one of the arguments implied was human but they didn't seem to when the arguments were not human and I was curious as to how you interpret that result why the nature of the argument should affect the application of the function Yes, this is a, a, a real problem for us, and uh, uh, again, there are lots of methodological issues, but let's put the lo logic in the following way. There are people who say, you don't have cross-domain uh, reasoning, you only have these little domains, then language comes in, and when language comes in, then you can apply rationality or whatever, like Speck uh, would suggest. I'm just m making a, a very bad presentation of her argument, but that's the essence. Now, uh, um, we do know, by previous research, that infants have uh, considered the human categories as a, as a favored category. And therefore, uh, um, because I find that 12 month olds react to this kind of uh, uh, situations only when there is a human on human contrast, uh, the possibility exists that it's the fact that they start learning words by using this junction that allows them to use this junction generally at 18 months. That is a possibility. But there is another possibility that is the one that we are exploring, namely that uh, the fact that infants uh, react to these uh, situations only by when we present human and non-human really has nothing to do with the categories per se, but with the fact that these are much easier 
uh, stimuli to encode for them. These are stimuli which are very particular. They are uh, difficult for infants. They are interested in that, but they have to fixate on the fact that there is a part which is common and uh, they can only see that part. So what we are trying to do now is, before giving up and saying, all right, we are obliged to say that uh, language acquisition and uh, uh, disjunction go in parallel. Uh, we are trying to find a way in which, uh, uh, independent of the category, infants can uh, react to these situations uh, by methodological reasons alone. Okay. So if it turned out that it, it weren't, then it would be, uh, then the story that we have to tell is a different story. And we have to recognize that the fact that infants start learning words efficiently by using the uh, 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 disjunctive uh, syllogism essentially allows them to apply this kind of reasoning to much wider uh, situations. Other questions? So I, I think in general you're right that experience isn't so much necessary for reasoning, but uh, what uh, infants seem to have a hard time uh, of having is a sufficiently rich notion of what alternatives it may expect, right? And that is where experience, at least for adult people, plays a certain role. If you limit experience. Uh, a certain situation, for instance, people do not expect it anymore, and hence reason in a very limited context. Yes, there are several issues in this question, which is really uh, uh, one is the following: the infants could have a, a hard time in realizing alternatives, not because they have hard time in realizing alternatives, but because this is computationally costly. That's a possibility, and that has to be dealt with by using maturation, essentially. And we know that adults do. When you have a computationally costly problem, they have a hard, hard time in keeping track of the uh, space structure of the problem. So that's one, one problem. The sec but this is nothing to do with experience, per se. This has to do with the limitation of, the, of, of humankind. There is nothing we can do about it, OK? There is a second possibility, is that infants have hard time because they can't reason about the situation. And that's what I am uh, countering. I think that infants are actually in a better situation than adults to reason about situations like that, essentially for the reason that Tim Chalice has proposed uh, uh, a long time ago. If you don't have a solution which is a prepackaged solution in your set of possibilities, then you've got to start reasoning from scratch. The less experience you have, the more you are obliged to use whatever tools that you have to reason, which could be limited because of uh, memory limitation and others, but that's what you have to get a solution. So I would say that there are a certain amount of cases. This, the one that we are presenting is not the only one. Uh, Ira Novik has also uh, uh, linguistic material in which he showed that infants make less error than adults in uh, the deductive syllogisms. We suggest that when infants do not have the information, they indeed can reason correctly. Now, of course, if you have it, why bother recomputing it? You will pull it out. But that's a completely different uh, 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 kind of situation, which can lead you to uh, uh, explore an alternative that you have not actually. I tell you, you know it, you get the solution. If the solution is get out of this door as fast as you can, because it, there is a fire inside. If I tell you the solution, you're not going to verify. I mean, you just do it, right? But that's, that's really exactly where I think the biases come from. If you have all these memory uh, uh, traces of prepackaged solutions and you don't have to compute them, then you're likely to make mistakes. So I'm not very sure that just giving ex extra experience improves uh, adults' uh, reasoning abilities. Okay. Can, I, can I have one more question or is there something else? Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah? Okay. I'm very pleased to see the convergence between psychology and, and models, logical models of reasoning uh, in the current work of cognitive science. But it seems like a classical problem that the logicians have always struggled with has sort of fallen between the cracks. So I wonder whether you have any view on the matter. And this is the problem that if you represent valid reasoning patterns, there is an infinity of conclusions we can draw from any set of assumptions, right? This is called the problem of logical omniscience very often, right? Yes. I hope you know it. Yeah, okay. So uh, is there hope that we could 
to use that problem when we look at, at the perhaps notions of complexity, notions of expense, like you saw, it's too expensive to compute certain things. Is, is, is that a way to go to solve this problem? That the, no, in principle, no. But uh, there are certainly solutions which actually have been proposed and they're, I think, correct. Uh, the, two, the two most famous solutions is one is the mental model ones that I didn't mention, but it's the most uh, 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 widespread in, in the literature. But in the mental logic solution, the one that I suggested, the one it's that the gives me the inspiration, uh, uh, Marty Brain, uh, David O'Brien, and, and they have worked out pretty well a system of inference which actually makes prediction about what is the order, uh, because this is natural deduction. So you have a procedure that applies the rules in a certain particular way, and uh, it's going to tell you that's the first consequence you're going to find. That's the second consequence you're going to find. Now, the point is you're not going to just stand, stay forever driving consequences, so you, but you have a model that tells you that's, that's the order, indeed. There is evidence that that order, at least for certain kind of uh, uh, very elementary reasoning path, is precisely respected by adults. So I give you a problem, and I see what is the first solu the, solu the first consequence that you find. That's always the same in certain kind of situations. So you can very easily set up a, a, um, a psychological response to this problem, saying, "Yeah, of course, the number of consequences of any logical problem is infinite, but you stop to the first one or to the second one, and that's really entirely dependent." on uh, uh, the amount of, uh, uh, of work that you need to do. And this, I mean, the, the, the theories that have been developed uh, about human deductive reasoning are very aware of this problem, and they have different solutions, but they do have solutions. So which is, is there a psychological sense why, for instance, a conclusion that introduces a disjunction, that's a valid pattern, P, Q, P, or Q, right? That's itself a valid pattern, it's not very useful. But why would th that that kind of a conclusion would be psychologically less plausible or less likely to be drawn? In, in the system, in the particular system of, of uh, natural deduction, which is supposed to be psychologically more plausible, that uh, Brain and O'Brien introduced uh, yeah. 20 years ago, yeah. that's not uh, a valid uh, consequence. Okay. So it's you a don't very have it. Different notion of validity. It is a different notion. Imagine that the logic that we are starting from is a subclass, subset of classical logic that you can define pretty precisely, which doesn't have this junction introduction, for example. Yeah, but uh, classical logic would be modal logic. Uh, well, you can pull any modal logic starting from a classical. In this case, we are talking about the disjunction, so let's, let's consider this just simply uh, propositional logic, A or B, because of your example. In this particular example, you are not going to have the problem because you don't have that rule. You just cannot derive from A, A or B. Right. Okay, so maybe you can, we can do follow up this discussion later on. Tim, for the last question. Uh, uh, each trial, a single ball comes out, and uh, yes, there are multiple trials for the baby, but for different situations, and that's only because we want to collect data for the baby. We can get the same result with one single response by just looking at the between subject design. It doesn't change. Yes, you can look at first trial, and you can do it, and uh, you, don't, you don't get, it's just a question of statistical power. So let me, let me understand the question. So okay, frequency information here is not given in terms of the outcome. Class distribution, which is not frequency of the outcome as it is intended by, by Cosmides Kigerente uh, to be. That information is there. Uh, uh, the way in which uh, the um, the experiment works uh, uh, precisely, I don't think I have the stimuli here, is that we familiarize infants with uh, two situations in which there is a two two ball distribution. They see the ball uh, going around, then there is one ball that 
falls down one single ball in complete view and then the occlusion comes later the reason why we do it is that we want infants to know what they have to expect and that is the way in which we essentially we direct infants without language to tell them that that's the situation you have to reason about and we have experiments in which we show that if we don't do the right pre-familiarization infants don't reason but why should they they have no idea what the, what the outcome the final outcome could be three balls coming out ten balls everything disappearing keeping going on forever so we do need to give a familiarization which does not contain probability information or not contain bias probability information about the outcome after we give this information then we get the results we want to get at, at least for the class of results that i presented you with the lotto and the balls that really is very solid so i don't know if this uh, helps in uh, Yes, but how do you think? Why should they do that? The point is, from a mental point, the point. Well, uh, the point is that we need to go into little details of discussion, and we went through that because I am for the mental logic, Vittorio Girotto is for the mental model theory. We we, we wrote this paper together, so we left purposely out what is the underlying uh, uh, derivational mechanism to get these results and you can run it both ways but my intuition is that mental models have hard time for the following reason uh, they are bound to say that infants build only one single model for reasons which have to do with the memory limitation and everything good but the single model is one object is coming out good now how do they know without having other information that, the mo th that they have to expect that the most probable one is going to be the yellow as opposed to the blue. They only know that there's one object that comes out. So if, you, if they need to think that the most probable is the yellow, they have to com com include either numerical information directly or else information about other possible outcomes which go beyond, not in, it's not incompatible with what John Soleil would say, quite the contrary, it is compatible, but it obliges them to think that the way in which the number of models is computed is different. Infants really have to imagine different models. That's possible. However, if you take this line, all the other results that the mental model theory have about adult reasoning don't work any longer. Because you have to assume that adults can compute many models, which is not, ex which is not what, uh, 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 what adults do, according to the theory. So it's not impossible to take the line you're suggesting, but if you look at it in the detail, in other words, you just really take a, a derivational mechanism like the one that Johnson Lever proposes, so you imagine the situation, and you co impose the constraints that they impose in the, uh, in the adult literature, you're not going to get the results you want. If you want, fine, you can, but then you have to go back and look at the other literature in which Johnson Lever says, oh, but if, if adults construct two models, then they make a mistake, but here they should construct at least two possibly three models, at least three, to see that there is an imbalance between, uh, uh, between different probabilities of outcome. Because the, the only single model is there is an object that comes out. That's it. Okay, so the point is, it is possible to do it that way, but, but then you, I'm, not con I'm not closing this possibility. I'm saying I'm taking inspiration by this theory that has been proposed by Brain and O'Brien because I know what I'm trying to do independent of the number of models. I'm just testing derivational uh, structures essentially. It's possible to do it that way. The question is how can you make it consistent with the rest of the literature and that's where the problem comes, my opinion. So we have time for our last quick question. Uh, yes, so it's, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the participants are not experiencing frequencies of balls coming out uh, of the device, but it's not that they're not experiencing frequencies at all. They're experiencing frequencies of movements by yellow and blue balls, more movements of yellow balls and movement of blue balls, and more near miss by uh, yellow balls than by blue balls, and so on and so on. So, so, so if one wanted to uh, uh, defend uh, frequencies version, I would say yes, you're right. It's not. Uh, it shows that the description of experiencing frequency of the thing about which you make the prediction 
uh, is not necessarily uh, uh, an appropriate description, but nevertheless, it's uh, experiencing uh, re relevant frequencies uh, that may uh, uh, explain the result you get. Uh, the point that I want to answer to you is that uh, um, there is independent evidence that uh, we have that this frequency, particular frequency, doesn't really count. It's not computed by infants per se. Let me give you the example. Uh, the frequency remains the same if I keep continuing repeating the situation. Okay, it's actually just it's just a, a, a transformation. So yeah, I, I repeat the same scene 20 times. You have 20 times the same frequency of movement and so on. However, what counts is the final outcome, not the frequency of previous movements. Because if I manipulate the final outcome to create a situation that is unfrequent, then they will respond to the final outcome, not to the frequency of information of the movement before. So you're right, this is a possibility, but I think this is not consistent with other data w that we have that suggest that really what counts at the end is initial class distribution and the final outcome, and not any intermediate frequency. So before uh, thanking Luca, a work from the organizers. For those who present a poster in the poster session now, could you afterwards take the poster off so that we have uh, free boards for tomorrow? Thanks a lot, Luca, for this um, presentation. <laughs> <laughs>